So let's start with the first here. I think at the very tip of this iceberg is Ubuntu. This is the most popular Linux distribution and the first distro for many people. It's known for being beginner friendly and having a huge community behind it. And most of the big beginner Linux distros are based off of it. But it's also hated by a lot of more experienced people in the Linux community for many reasons with the major one being the Snap Package Management System, and just for me personally, overall stability has seemed to gone down the drain. And the next up we have Linux Mint. This is another very popular beginner distro based on Ubuntu. It has a Windows-like layout through Cinnamon and comes with a nice suite of pre-installed tools developed by the Mint team, such as TimeShift Web App Manager and Warpinator. And the Linux Mint team is the main group of people behind their very popular desktop environment, Cinnamon. And speaking of desktop environments, we have GNOME and Plasma. GNOME and Plasma are two of the biggest desktop environments in the Linux world. GNOME uses the GTK toolkit and has a very unique workflow behind it. It has a lot more consistency than other desktops in the Linux world, while Plasma uses the Qt toolkit and uses more of a traditional workflow that allows almost as much customization as you want. Of course, at the expense of overall consistency. Given that they are the two biggest desktops, and they are so different from each other, many people debate over which one is better. GNOME comes pre-installed in many popular distros including Debian, Pop! OS, Ubuntu, Fedora, Zorin OS, and Plasma comes pre-installed on distros such as Kubuntu, Manjaro, Plasma, Farin OS, and KDE's flagship distro KDE Neon. And then that takes us to VirtualBox. This is a program for creating virtual machines, which is basically virtual computers within your computer for testing different operating systems. Many Linux users first try Linux through VirtualBox before switching to it or installing it on their computer. And some people even run Linux full time through VirtualBox. Next, how to install uh, insert Windows app on Linux. This is a thing that every beginning Linux user has looked up at some point. A lot of people miss one app when they switch to Linux, and they spend a lot of time installing Wine and trying to get that application running. Most of the time, if they have issues, the application won't work, and they give up to try to find an alternative, or end up just switching back to Windows. Now, when it comes to distributions, a lot of new users don't know what distro to try first, so they check either Distro Watch or Distro Chooser. Distro Chooser tries to help people find Distro for them, but the problem is it doesn't really narrow down the results for you. And then Distro Watch is a site that a lot of people use to browse through and find various Linux distributions, but the problem with this one is rankings are based on page views and not on the distros that people are actually using. But with this, it is actually a pretty great site for general information as many distros publish their updates to it, and there's a lot of actual reviews and things like that. Overall, it's a pretty decent resource. And speaking of finding distros, we're gonna talk about newbie distros. This is a term that often describes Linux distributions aimed at beginners, but specifically Ubuntu and Ubuntu-based distros achieve this, such as Linux Mint, Zorn OS, Elementary OS, Farin OS, and Pop OS. And there are some Arch-based distros such as Manjaro and Garuda Linux that are considered a newbie distro. And now we're going to have to finish off tier 1 by talking about the Raspberry Pi. This is a very popular $30 single board computer, that is if you can actually find one. And it is absolutely loved by Linux users because of the low cost and the modularity of it. You can easily extend the functionality of the Raspberry Pi with parts off of Amazon, and it has many use cases including as a retro console, media center with Kodi, a cheap server host, and much more. And it's also known for bringing a lot of people into the Linux world thanks to its specific custom Linux distro called Raspberry Pi OS. Now we're going to go down to tier two. We're still slightly above sea level, so a lot of this stuff is going to be pretty common and familiar. And the first thing is going to be Lutris. This is a program for managing your games that works with just about every platform that you can think of. This program can integrate with emulators, different game launchers, and it's known for its community-maintained wine scripts that can get many different Windows games running on Linux very easily. It's definitely not the end-all be-all, but it is a fantastic tool. And now in tier two, we're gonna have to talk about Manjaro, and this is a popular Arch-based Linux distro that is kind of geared towards the intermediate Linux crowd. It's a rolling release just like Arch, but holds its own packages to make sure that they are fully tested before they push updates. It also has graphical tools such as Pamac, which is one of the best software managers on an Arch Linux system, as well as things like their setting manager for picking various kernels, 
However, some users don't really like it because of the held back packages are known to do things such as breaking other AUR packages. And on the other side of Manjaro, we have Debian. Debian is a Linux distribution known for being a very rock solid and stable system. Some of the packages can be years old. In fact, the GNOME version in the latest release is still from 2020. Its main repositories contain only free software with separate non-free repositories. It is also the distro that Ubuntu is based on and therefore the grandparent of all Ubuntu-based distributions. This makes Debian a very hit or miss distro based on exactly what you're looking for because a lot of the enthusiasts do not like how old the packages are, but a lot of people who just prefer Linux don't care about that and they love it because it works and it's just incredibly stable. So now let's shift focus to some of the tier two desktop environments. First up, we have Mate. This is a desktop environment that continues the development of GNOME 2. Basically, the community was split when GNOME 3 came out, and that's because it was known for being buggy, removing features, and a lot of people didn't like the initial design. This resulted in Mate due to it being lightweight and still supporting a workflow that they're used to. A lot of different distros have their own Mate flavor, such as Ubuntu, Linux Mint, Solus, and Fedora, and even Triskel is one of the few that ships it out stock. Now, if you're looking for some old school Windows 98 vibes, look no further than XFCE. Many people love it because it's very lightweight, but it can be customized to give you the right looking system while being very snappy. And is sometimes the default environment on Linux distributions geared towards older hardware, such as Zorn OS Lite, MX Linux, and more. So continuing the trend of desktop environments, we have Cinnamon. We talked about this a little bit earlier. This is the one developed by the Linux Mint team. And this one was actually forked over from GNOME 3. The goal of Cinnamon was to have the main features of GNOME 3 with a more traditional Windows-y style that GNOME 3 started to take away. It originally just replaced the GNOME shell, but was still built on top of other GNOME components, but this eventually turned into its own thing completely. In addition to being installed on Linux Mint as the flagship distro, there's many other distros that have their own official or community maintained spins like Manjaro, Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu, and more. Next up is a website that you are sure going to run into when you are looking for those software alternatives, and that is Alternative 2. This is a user curated website for finding alternatives for different programs. The website's cool because you can find a lot of different software on it. There's a rating system and various tags for all the different applications listed. And every application has its own Alternatives 2 tab in which you'll find a list of a bunch of different programs that will do something similar. And by now in the Linux journey, you probably opened up the terminal and one of the things you're going to be curious about is something you've maybe seen in a video or you've seen a screenshot of and that is a fetch script. These are CLI scripts or apps that show system information such as the operating system, kernel, uptime, desktop environment, and some of your hardware configurations such as CPU, GPU, and RAM usage. The most popular of these scripts is NeoFetch, but many others do exist. So now we're getting on to tier 3. At this point, you've had some experience, you've been on various Reddit threads, and you've probably been dabbling around in the Linux community for at least a couple weeks. First up is the classic copypasta of GNU slash Linux. You've probably seen this quite a bit. I'd like to interject for a moment. What you're referring to as Linux is in fact GNU slash Linux. This is a form of something the Free Software Foundation likes to push, that you aren't actually running Linux, but in fact you're actually running GNU slash Linux because Linux is the kernel and GNU is the actual combination of various packages and tools that make up the operating system. This copypasta was born off of a 2011 post on Richard Stallman's blog and is often used as a troll, whether that be on 4chan, Reddit, YouTube, or any other parts of the internet. And it's even made its way onto a podcast. Well, before we get into anything, let me read a couple of emails we had. Uh, this one. Okay. Uh, this is a good one here. Hey, guys, this has been bothering me for a while now. I was listening to the show, and I'd just like to interject for a moment. What you're referring to as Linux is, in fact, GNU Linux, or as I've recently taken to calling it, GNU Plus Linux. NVIDIA graphics cards on Linux are known for being a rather painful experience for some Linux users. NVIDIA, for the longest time, has made its drivers proprietary, causing a difficulty when it comes to getting these GPUs to work properly on some Linux distributions, including the big ones like Debian and Fedora. 
However, NVIDIA has made a recent effort to start open sourcing some of their driver, but the damage has already been done when it comes to the overall reputation within the Linux community. NVIDIA has been the single worst company we've ever dealt with. So NVIDIA, <laughs> you. And then moving on from there, we have uh, some dangerous commands that you may have been recommended to fix your system, including sudo rm-rf and a few others. Because Linux gives people the freedom basically to do whatever they want in their system and also allows you to break your system. This has resulted in many instances of trolls getting new users to delete their root partitions by running the sudo rm-rf no preserve root forward slash command and other dangerous commands such as the fork bomb which just uses all your resources until you reboot. And there's other ones such as dd if equals dev random of dev sda, which overwrites your drive with random data. And personally, my favorite troll, setting the default in its system to sbin forward slash reboot. All of these, again, are trolls, and you shouldn't take anybody's advice when it comes to running these commands. Next up, we're going to talk about Arch Linux here. This is a Linux distro known for being bleeding edge and do it yourself overall. Earlier in this iceberg, we talked about Manjaro, which is a Arch based distribution. Arch itself is a little bit further down the rabbit hole as it will almost always give you the latest version of various packages and you can customize Arch almost however you want aside from things that require compiling the kernel and other things of that nature. However, Arch has been known for being quite difficult to install, which has sparked the meme, by the way, I use Arch, based on teasing Arch users who just feel superiority over other users for installing the difficult system. It's also a common meme to compare Arch users to vegans based on the people always telling you that they're vegan or an Arch user. Now, if you're down this rabbit hole, chances are you've stumbled across Unix porn. This is a subreddit where people share their Linux, BSD, and macOS setups. Because of Linux customability, you can literally make it look almost however you want it to look. So basically, this is a subreddit where people share their customized or quote unquote riced setups, usually with a fetch script running as well to flex their various Arch installations. And a little deeper, we have Vim. This is a text editor pre-installed on many Linux distros, built on top of another text editor called VI. In fact, Vim actually stands for VI Improved. This, again, is a common meme among Linux users because Vim is known for having a difficult learning curve. And part of the meme is people not knowing how to actually exit the program because the standard Control-C or Control-Q shortcuts do not work. Vim, however, is very extensive, and if you actually get used to using it, it is a fantastic tool, but for me personally, I will stick with Nano. The Linus Tech Tips Linux content is something that most people just generally skim over, but when it comes to the Linux community, it is deeply ingrained. Uh, LTT is a Canadian tech YouTuber known for crazy PC builds, and, and of course, he's already a meme in the general tech community, thanks to his uh, Twitter selfies. But like I said, he's also a uh, meme in the Linux community due to his Linux series, specifically the first episode where he installed Pop! OS and broke it when he tried to install Steam, which many people in the Linux community reacted to, including myself, unfortunately. If you want a great compilation of Linux YouTubers just being simply out of touch with reality, go ahead and check out the link down below and here's some of it real quick. Apt get install OBS. Why isn't this working? I'm not sure if Linus is actually trying to troll. In spite of its spectacularly stupid name, pop exclamation mark underscore OS. So he types yes, do as I say, and then is surprised that his entire computer collapses. Are you kidding me? Half of the criticisms he had on this video are completely unfair. They had absolutely nothing to do with Linux or Manjaro. The at the beginning of every year, people declare that it is in fact the year of the Linux desktop. And this has been going on for literally decades now. Here's an article from ZDNet calling 2004 the year of the Linux desktop. And just check out this shirt from 1999, the year of the penguin. There's even a website called YWTLD.com, which stands for the year of the Linux desktop. And it's literally just a countdown to the new year. And it just seems like at this point, every year will be the year of the desktop until the end of time. Okay, now diving even deeper into tier four, we have some meme distros. One of the cool things about Linux in general is that anybody can really just create their own distribution, which has resulted in quite a few distros created specifically as a joke. 
One of the most popular of these distros is Hannah Montana Linux. But there's many more, including Justin Bieber Linux, Rebecca Black OS, which was actually one of the very first distributions to ship Wayland. We have Among Us OS, which shout out to uh, some ordinary gamer for mentioning my quote on uh, Among Us OS. And of course, Tech Hut going, Chad Omogus versus Bloated Mainstream Distro. Agreed, Tech Hut, agreed. In addition, there's also Ubuntu Satanic Edition, which actually comes with free metal music. Then we have Mo Ubuntu and Suicide Linux, which will simply wipe your system if you make a mistake on the command line. Next up, Linux users installing a web browser is a common joke within both the Linux and just tech community in general, and just start typing a bunch of commands all to do a simple task such as installing a web browser. And that takes us to another distro called Void Linux. This is a distribution that is described as a mix between Linux and BSD. It uses Run It as the init system and has a version of Void that uses Musil instead of GLBC and its own custom package manager called XBPS. This distro is commonly joked about due to it being slightly more advanced than Arch, just from it being so different in general. And if you've spent any time within the Linux community, chances are you've been called a noob or pleb or something for using something like GNOME or KDE. And that's because a lot of Linux users run out of desktop environments to try and then move on to just pure window managers instead. You have floating window managers like Fluxbox, Ice Window Manager, are examples of ones that are really lightweight alternatives to a traditional desktop environment. However, if you want a different type of desktop, you can try a tiling window manager such as DWM Awesome, BSP Window Manager, X Nomad, Rat Poison, or even Qtile. And of course, everybody's favorite, i3 and Sway. Instead of windows just popping open everywhere, these window managers automatically tile them onto the screen, and some of them don't even have window borders. On top of that, many window managers come with almost no defaults and many missing features, which means you have to assemble your desktop yourself when it comes to using one of these. This makes window managers a common flex in the Linux world, especially on places like Unix born that we mentioned earlier. Now, at this point, you've probably been looking for some good Linux native games, and you might have stumbled across Super Tux and Super Tux Cart. Both are open source games that are enjoyed by many Linux users. Super Tux is a Mario clone following the Linux Tux Penguin's adventure to save his quote unquote friend Penny, and its music is far too good for what it is. Super Tux Kart is a racing game featuring all the mascots of different open source projects including Linux, GIMP, KDE, and OpenBSD. And honestly, it's a very fun racing game if you haven't tried it out, and it's even got some wonderful multiplayer support. And if you're this deep, by far you've gotten into trying to figure out who the hell Richard Stallman is. He's also known as RMS and the founder and former head of the Free Software Foundation, and the founder and head of the GNU Project. On top of all this, he's also known for his huge detaste of proprietary software, which he himself has sparked many memes about free alternatives to common software. And don't worry, by free, I do mean freedom, not free beer. And of course, we're going to be mentioning him a couple times in this video. And just to bring up another Linux distribution, we have Kali Linux. This is a distro specifically for hackers. It is based on Debian and ships a bunch of pre-installed tools for pen testing and doing some security research. It also has several versions, including a standard system for bare metal ARM versions and for things such as the Raspberry Pi 4 and Pinebook Pro. And it even has its own custom ROM for Android devices for people who simply just want to hack their phone. Now this distribution is pretty decent, has a lot of good tools for people in the security sector, but it kind of also has become a meme due to all the nine year old kids who download it so they can try to become a hacker man. To end off this tier, we're gonna talk about Discord on Linux. This, if you don't know, is a very popular messaging and voice chat application. By the way, check out the link down below for our server. However, one thing that is known for by Linux users is how bad the Discord client is. If you're running on Xord, it is generally fine, although it is missing some features such as crisp noise suppression and screen sharing audio. However, Discord is running a really outdated version of Electron, which causes a lot of issues for Wayland users. For example, Discord on Wayland has many issues with screen sharing, and if you're running Wayland on NVIDIA, you, uh, good luck. 
and this has caused someone to create an open letter to Discord to update their Electron version. So now we have tier five. At this point, we're really getting deep into the weeds and something you've probably heard before, whether it's been said to you or you've read it, is that your crap is bloated. The word bloated in the Linux community is used sarcastically most of the time, just to describe something that somebody doesn't like. It's basically thrown around so much, whether that be on YouTube comments or on certain Linux subreddits, that it itself has kind of become a meme and in most cases doesn't really mean anything anymore especially considering any distro that isn't Arch with a Tiling window manager, Gen 2 or LFS is considered to be bloat by the R slash Linux standards. Now, moving on from there, we're gonna talk about Red Star OS. This is a Linux distribution developed by the North Korean government designed to replace Windows XP and used on computers in the region. And it runs a modified version of KDE 3.0 that looks somewhat similar to Mac OS. It comes with its very own version of Firefox that's kind of spooky. For example, it has custom IP tables that prevent it from accessing non-North Korean websites, but it is possible to harden it to essentially make it not malware. If you're interested, Mental Outlaw has a pretty good video on it, and speaking of Mental Outlaw, he is a YouTuber and probably my personal favorite in this uh, niche category of content who makes a wide range of stuff, including covering various Linux distributions, open source software, as well as privacy and security related news. And of course the occasional based cooking video. He also uses Gentoo, which makes him far more based and superior to almost any other Linux YouTuber. And if you want to be truly based in this community, you have to hate system D. This is a init system on your computer. In other words, it's simply a program that the Linux kernel loads up to kind of load the rest of your computer. However, a lot of people hate system D for one reason or another, and the most common one being people not liking it because it technically violates the Unix philosophy by doing a ton of different things instead of doing one thing and one thing very well. This has resulted in the creation of several distributions that are really just a base distro with a different in its system. This includes uh, Duv Duvian, Devon, something, it's just Debian without system D and uh, Artix, which is basically Arch without system D. And now, of course, in this specific tier, we need to cover a few different distributions. And the first one is going to be Tails. This is a security focused operating system based on Debian that runs off of a USB drive that you can just plug into your computer and use instead of your current operating system. And it does things like use Tor browser by default instead of Firefox. It encrypts persistent storage, blocks applications that try to use the internet without Tor, and completely wipes everything that isn't part of the persistent storage when you shut down your computer. This makes it very popular for people who need to do something very securely, for example, activists and journalists. And then of course we have to bring up Gentoo. We mentioned this earlier. This is a Linux distribution that you have to compile literally everything from source. This gives you customization even past the levels that Arch Linux is gonna give you because you can customize your system down to the compiler flags. It also makes Gentoo even harder to install on a system than Arch because you have to spend hours compiling things with basic stuff like Chromium taking up to six hours to complete. This makes Gentoo the perfect operating system if you want to flex on those Arch users, by the way. However, Linux from scratch is the ultimate flex. This isn't actually a uh, distro per se, but a book on how to install a complete Linux system from scratch. This is obviously very hard to do and not really something most people would want to run, but honestly, it's a very good learning experience because it teaches you literally everything you need to know about Linux inside and out. Now kind of switching gears here, one thing that is kind of funny and worth mention is Extra PC. This is a product that claims to restore your old computer to be as good as new. Problem is it uses deceptive marketing tactics to kind of pull in non tech savvy people. And some of the advertisements are just really cringe. That uh, has no hard drive at all. And let's see what happens with there. <laughs> Extra PC, it just came up on the screen. I've never seen this. Boom. <laughs> that was fast. <gasps> oh my yeah, God. Goodbye Glacier, right? <laughs> What extra PC actually is, is a USB drive with Linux on it, and that's literally it. They also don't provide ISOs of the OS it runs, which some people have speculated to be a GPL license violation. And now we are getting into tier six. You've probably heard of GNU slash Linux, but have you heard of GNU slash 
herd. GNU slash herd is a custom kernel made by the GNU project, and yes, this replaces Linux. This is built off of the match micro kernel and consists of several servers for different functions of the kernel. This basically moves most of the kernel's functions to the user space, which means that if one certain component crashes randomly, it won't take down the entire kernel. So this kind of makes it slightly slower, but a lot more stable and secure than your standard monolithic kernel. Right now it is in the extremely experimental stages, and only a few GNU slash her distributions actually exist, such as the Debian and Arch variants. And another thing that isn't technically Linux is Temple OS. This is an operating system designed to be the third temple prophesized by the Bible. The story behind this operating system could be its very own Hollywood movie as it was written by Terry Davis, a genius programmer with severe schizophrenia. Now, this is actually really impressive because he made the full operating system with a language called Holy C, a compiler for it, a bootloader, a kernel, window manager, and a 3D graphics engine, and several games, all within 1.4 megabytes. And he did all of this by himself completely from scratch. Unfortunately, Terry Davis had struggled with homelessness and incarceration, which led him to walking on a rail and dying by train on August 11th in 2018, ending the Temple OS saga. Moving on from there, we have the Halloween documents. These were a series of documents that showed Microsoft's strategy against Linux. Some of them were leaked internally out of Microsoft, others were official Microsoft responses to these leaked documents, and a few were written as responses. The most important documents were one through three, with documents one and two describing how Microsoft purposely spreads FUD to make Windows look good, and sort of revealed the steps for Microsoft's internally nicknamed Embrace, Extend, Extinguish strategy. And document three is the official response from Microsoft acknowledging that the documents were real. And if you do want to learn more about this, check out Forrest Knight's video on them. Speaking of Windows, Windows Refund Day was a day that several Linux users went outside Microsoft's office to protest. The protests were because the Windows EULA said that those who do not agree with the EULA could get a refund from the manufacturing of their copy of Windows. However, most manufacturers didn't know about this and therefore wouldn't give out the refunds. Some Linux users from a local Linux user group met up at a Denny's to prepare, and then they stormed the Microsoft offices. Microsoft even played along with some executives and reporters meeting them there and giving them drinks. And yes, this was on the news. Gnome. Gnome was a jointed April Fool's prank from the Gnome and KDE teams saying that they were merging into one. This desktop environment had features such as the new QTK Toolkit Zero Bugs and Gnome Mobile. It will also be your new desktop now or something next week, although hitting download would result in a Rick roll. In this next one, I'm going to lead with a question. Are you a true Linux advocate? or even a programmer if you do not have some programming socks. These come in pastel colors and common colors in the LGBTQ community. 4chan started the programming socks meme with it later being spread to Twitter. It even got to the point where if you search up programming socks on Amazon thigh highs will come up. Moving on to some distros within this tier, we have Hyperbola and Parabola. We covered these in slightly more detail in our Your Distro Isn't Free video, definitely worth checking out. Click the I if you're interested. But these are basically forks of Arch Linux that are fully free software compliant. Parabola is really close to Arch, but it doesn't ship any proprietary software, including kernel blobs. And Hyperbola is a bit different, being that it's more like Debian when it comes to the update structure with a lot of older packages, and they do some things such as removing system D. So if you're looking to have just slightly more superiority compared to a regular Arch Linux user, these might be something you want to look into. And we all know of uh, OpenSUSE, but did you know that they have a good amount of songs? This company has several parodies of popular songs, including What Does the Fox Say? What's the chameleon say? <laughs> a parody called Uptime Funk. Don't reboot it, just patch. Ow. And a Rage Against the Machine parody called Coding in the Name of. Coding in the Name of. 
Additionally, they also have a few non-parody songs, including the Seuss pronunciation song. But it's Seussa, yes Seussa, now say it with me, Seussa! It starts like Sue, that girl you knew, who took your heart, tore it in two, and then she left you feeling blue, you're all alone, no one loves you! Now, almost ending the iceberg, we have tier seven. If something's a computer, I won't accept it if it has non-free software in its system. This video is from an iconic Richard Stallman speech where he rants about iBed and cell phones. In this, he says that he will not use a phone because they all have non-free software. And let's go ahead and show some of the best moments of this speech. Live blog this using my Exo Linux laptop, but the battery wasn't charged, so I had to but resort it's not to my Linux, it's the GNU operating, GNU system. operating system. <laughs> so I, I had to resort. I wouldn't accept a jailbroken iBed. So what do you do about a cell phone? Well, I don't have a cell phone <laughs> uh, because they all have malicious features. They're tracking and surveillance devices. Even the cell phones that are not computers that don't offer the possibility of installing any software. They're still <coughs> tracking devices. Well, yes, how often do you take the battery out of your tracking device? <laughs> you see, what did you say? I don't care. Ah, well, I don't have one either. See, that's the real solution. Well, I have a phone, but I don't care what. You know what? Somebody can, back there is listening to me and talk to you. Well, I don't mind if they hear me here. This is good. This is being recorded for publication. This is a public speech. Big Brothers men would be welcome to sit in the audience. Uh, this is not what all. This is not a model for all of life. Install Gentoo. Install Gentoo is a joke, hopefully, where trolls tell new Linux users just to install Gentoo, which, as was mentioned earlier, is one of the hardest Linux distributions to install at all. This statement kind of gives me the same vibes or the uh, Linux equivalent of telling a Windows user to delete System32. You can also refer to this bizarre video from 2011 called Install Gentoo with a guy dancing in a bathrobe. <laughs> 4chan forward slash G. 4chan is known for being a site with barely any rules, unfortunately which is known to cause chaos on the internet. The G board is a joke in the Linux community due to them only recommending distributions like Arch, Artix, Gentoo, and idolizing Richard Stallman. Due to the point that Richard Stallman himself even stated, I tried to look at that site, but I only saw insane comments. Twitch installs Arch. Now this one just makes me happy. Uh, this it was a social experiment where they had Twitch attempt to install Arch one key at a time. This worked by many people in the chat spamming a specific key for a certain amount of time, and then that key would be inputted into the system. Somehow they did it in the span of 69 hours. Nice. They did struggle with some things like entering passwords correctly, but they did get i3 installed, almost made a Twitter account, somehow booted into what looks like Windows XP as well as Windows Server 2012, and ran the sudo rm-rf command that breaks the system in which caused them to restart before reinstalling it to continue the shenanigans, including playing Pokemon. Probably one of the greatest live streams of all time. Now, almost as great as that, we have Luke Smith. Luke Smith is a Linux YouTuber known for several things. He does live streams about once a month where he just talks about random stuff, as well as his opinions on technology related topics, tutorials, and even some politic or religious stuff. People see him as a meme because he has had some controversial opinions, and some people see him as a living version of the 4chan forward slash G on YouTube. Personally, I like a, a lot of the stuff he produces, some things more than others for sure. Every once in a while scrolling through his YouTube, you might stumble across a little gem that may be helpful. <laughs> oh yeah, and he uses Arch, by the way. Free Software Song. The Free Software Song is a beautiful piece of music written by Richard Stallman. He wrote this at a flick singing session at a sci-fi convention and sang it when it was his turn. In which case, he said you should show it to Richard Stallman, in which he replied, I am Richard Stallman. And this is just how the free software song masterpiece was born. Join us now and share the software. You'll be free hackers. You'll be 
free. There have even been other versions of this song made, including a metal version by John O. Bacon. And the Moo Gnu version from 4chan. Libre Boot. This is an open source firmware that can replace the BIOS on your motherboard for certain motherboards. The firmware is installable on several laptops, including several types of ThinkPads and even a MacBook. There's also a Core Boot, which is actually just what Libre Boot is based off of. However, Core Boot doesn't really support any existing hardware and is more something for an OEM to ship. For example, Prism, System76, Star Labs, and even some Chromebooks ship with Core Boot. Plan 9 is a Unix-based operating system developed by Bell Labs. That started development in the 80s based on the original Unix concepts from the Bell Labs experiments in the 1960s. The system has invented many things such as the 9P protocol, special file system locations including forward slash PROC, where processes can be manipulated through a file, and forward slash net, which is similar, but used for network connections instead. On August 15, 2000, Richard Stallman posted about how he was a saint in the church of Emacs and how he blessed your computer with Emacs. This has become a con Now I know, when it comes to this iceberg of Linux content, there was a, definitely a few things left out here and there, and I would like to know, is there something I should have included in this video? If you think so, please leave it in the comments down below, and then maybe eventually we will do a follow-up video somehow. With all of that, do make sure you subscribe and ring that bell. I promise this isn't how I usually uh, do my videos. But if you have any interest in technology, open source software, or anything like that, make sure you subscribe and you ring that bell. With all of that, I do hope you have an absolutely beautiful day and goodbye.